available to take some questions uh, to take a couple bre a little break from their scouting meetings upstairs. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. We'll pass you a mic as Todd Zalecki has already. And we'll go starting with Todd. Hey, Dave. Uh, Good morning. Morning. Uh, Bryce saw Dr. Elitrash on Monday. Yes. What is the update? He is uh, going to have surgery next Wednesday, a week from today, by Dr. Elitros. Um, we have no prognosis, really, until he goes into the elbow and takes a look at it at that time. But he will have surgery uh, on Wednesday. So we don't know if it's Tommy John or there was another one that's more similar yeah. to the Reese Hoskins yes, surgery? Yes, we're not sure of that. We're not sure of that. Okay. So um, uh, at this point, uh, we'll, I mean, we'll have something at that time with the surgery um, and, and the anticipation something will happen. Um, I would think it will slow him down for the season, but we'll know more next week. Does that impact how you tackle the offseason or not? Well, it could, um, but I don't know that until we really get the, the full diagnosis of it. So, uh, I mean, we're having meetings now. We cover every single, hopefully every single topic we can think of, possible clubs, free agent signings, trades, all of that stuff. So, um, you know, in the back of our mind, there is some, will be discussions of you know, what do we do if, which may be nothing, you know, because you know, we're in a situation that, I mean, right now we're looking at it coming back in DH and at some portion of it, we have other players that can DH, you know, between, you know, when you look around Schwarber and Castellanos and Hoskins and Bohm and Riamoto, if we want to give them some time off. So we need to kind of fit that all into the total picture of what we'll be doing. It said this summer that if he had Tommy John, if it got to that extreme, he kind of compared. Otani had Tommy John surgery, where he ended up coming missing a little bit of time early on, and then DHing. Is that kind of your understanding of it as well? Well, the possibility, the problem you end up, um, and just and that's why it's everybody's ligaments different on where it could be torn, and how much of a tear it is, and all. So until they get in there, we're really not sure. Okay, go to John in the back, middle. So, so for your planning purposes, when you go into this, not knowing maybe the amount of time, are you looking at you could possibly not have him for a f the first couple months, or you know it could be half a season that he's able to, to be out there in DAG? I really don't have anything more to say on it that, you know, other than that, because I have to really wait. So that's really where we are on it. We just have to wait and see what happens. So okay. Scott, right in the front. You guys got through, you know, two months without him this year um, and had a really good record during that time. Um, can you kind of lean on, you know, guys like Derek Hall and, and, you know, some guys who helped get you through during the season? Is that kind of something that's been discussed is that, hey, look, we, we did this during the year. We can do this for two months or three months next year. Well, we like some of our alternatives that we have. I mean, and I, I think like anything else, you, you determine how you're going to address your club in total. I mean, we've talked about, I mean, we've lost free agent players. Um, it's left us with starting pitching need. I mean, some of it from internal, but also to look at that market, we've talked about, you know, Gene is not back with us at this point. Uh, we have flexibility to look at what the middle infield situation would be. So we have some different things that relief pitching because um, we lost some of those so I think you fit all of those things in together and see what you think makes your best club. But we do have some people that we like, um, and I think it de is dependent upon, I think, it, again, when we originally, and in sometimes best laid plans go for naught, I mean, when we originally made the schwarber Castellano signing, they, the idea was that one of them would be our DH the majority of the time and wouldn't play in the outfield. Well, they both play in the outfield. So it does open up the position that you could have some flexibility on who you DH for a short time period. But do you do, we like what Derek Hall did for us. We like Derek Hall. Um, do we think that using him in a role depending upon the time compared to what other moves we may make gives us the best chance to win? We'll just have to wait and see. Okay, Tim in the back in the center. Dave, what did you see from Castellanos this year that maybe his production wasn't at the level it's typically been? Well, I mean, Castellanos is normally a, an offensive force. I mean, he, he can hit. And he uses the whole field. He drives the ball. 
Um, I think probably one of his biggest problems, I mean, he has always been in a situation where um, he's not a real disciplined strike zone hitter. This year he was even um, worse in that regard. So I don't think that that helped him at times. I'm not sure how much of it also was with dealing with all the adjustments that just come with signing with the new club, all the adjustment, new baby coming into the life in May, um, all of that. So I, I, some of that could be a, from a mental perspective. I, there's no reason why he still should not hit with authority. Sometimes you just got to take that step back, have a winter time, and come back. But I mean, if you watch him take batting practice, he still drives the ball all over the place. He still has tremendous power. He's a hitter. Um, he did not have a good year offensively this year, but um, I think he'll also have to come with some additional strikes on discipline. Beyond the oblique injury, was he dealing with anything throughout the season? No. Oh, well, I can't say he ever had nothing, because I, but nothing of major consequence. And, and I really, at the end, it's a shame, because he really started to swing the bat better, and then he had the oblique, which shut him down. And we had, a, we had to hurry him back, of course, for the postseason. So it's hard to kind of jump in after that time down and come back and hit. So um, he gave it everything he can. He had some good, good plate appearances. But I don't think that at the end of the season would be his actual best because he just didn't have the time to come back and properly get his timing back. OK, Alex in the front left. This is for either Dave or Sam. Um, <clears throat> there are a bunch of rule changes heading into the 2023 season, but specifically, um, with the ban of the defensive shift, how do you think that that'll impact some of your decision making this off season? Well, I, I don't think um, there are changes. I mean, and of course, you take those into consideration. So banning of the shift, uh, it may change some of the players' batting averages, but depends on who that is. I'm not sure that you put a lot. We already have a guy like Schwarber and Hoskins that are two of the better guys that should benefit by that. Um, I, I do think it comes into play on your defense up the middle um, because you can't shift over to the other side. You can't cover a guy that maybe doesn't have as much range as another player would be. But I still think you can cover for some of that still by shifting. So it comes into play. But um, I'd have to say um, to a point. We, we still haven't been a club that has just Signed. We had Gene, so we were bene we had a benefit in that regard. And Stott has good range at second base, so we really don't have the stationary type second baseman that some clubs may have more of, because they knew that they could shift themselves out of that. We really haven't had those type of guys at second. Follow up on Nick. What gives you the confidence that next season he can perform in this market to the level that you expect him to perform? I don't think this market was his reason behind not performing. I mean, some people I think could be like that. I don't think that was his reason. I think um, he's always hit, and you look at people that are hitters, they do have a downtime. Um, sometimes they try too hard coming off as free agents. He did have a lot of adjustments in his life. I mean, all things he really needs to, to work through, it just didn't happen for him. But I think. Having all that with the winter time where he can kind of just settle in and be ready to go, I think will benefit him a great deal. Okay, Todd on the left. Would you guys be surprised if he didn't get one of those four free agent shortstops, considering the need right now? Um, I, I wouldn't say that I'd be surprised. I just would say that, again, we're open to a lot of things. We have a shortstop that we like in Sosa. Um, so we'll just wait and see. Jimmy on the right. Dave, uh, just on Bryce, did your doctors looked at him last week? And yes. did they also come to the same conclusion as Dr. Elatros that he needed surgery? Um, well, they were going to wait till Dr. Dr. Elatros saw him. And so they thought the possibility exists. Our trainer, Paul Buchheit, went out there with him. So he was at both of the visits. And then Dr. Cohen is still on the phone with Dr. Elatros at that time. So, um, so we had consistent information. But I think also the feeling is we just need to wait till they get in there. Yeah. Yes. And how about Wheeler? How's his condition? Obviously, he threw, really threw well that last night. But um, there were, you know, spent some time a month on the IL, and there was that fatigue issue. Is he, is he healthy in, in you guys' analysis, in your guys' analysis? Yes. Is nothing medically planned for him this offseason? Well, you know, let me just say, 
there's a lot of players that have health things that we follow up on um, that I really can't disclose with HIPAA type of rules, but um, and numerous. I mean, basically, after a long season, almost every player you have some type of follow up on, but we don't have any type of medical concerns at this point with him going into next next season. And and on, on Reese Hoskins, is anything planned with him for the winter? Um, to work on his defense? <laughs> well, I, I don't can't say that there's anything he's going to be doing in the winter time for his defense. Um, I mean, you've, had, you've done that with other players over the years. Yeah, but, you know, he worked hard on it, and he'll work hard in the spring, and maybe something somebody will talk to him at some point. Right now, um, we know, I mean, Reese is one. He, he actually improved metrically when you look at it this year compared to how he has been in the past. Um, he's not a gold glove first baseman. I think you just have to come up with the reality. He works very, very hard. I'm sure he'll work, continue to do that during spring training. We don't have any specifics right now, but we just, we're just finishing the season and getting through the year. Um, you know, does he go down to Clearwater early and somebody's there? I, I cannot answer that at this point. Just wondering where you come down on in your quest to improve the club um, in terms of need, would it be lineup? We we know what the shortstop market is, middle infield flexibility, or possibly rotation with, you know, Wheeler and Nola experience some fatigue. You might be breaking in a young guy next year. Would you be looking to improve that rotation either with depth or even maybe more than that? Something maybe that that profiles closer to the top of the rotation. Well, uh, and this way, it's, we're open to and feel that we probably need to do something from a starting pitching perspective, at least somebody there are depth, even though we have the big three guys. And we have Falter and Sanchez and somebody like Painter coming. We know how important depth is. So we're open-minded to that. Doesn't necessarily have to be a top of the rotation type guy, but we like the, we'll explore that market. I think like every, almost every other club in baseball, we're gonna be open-minded to the relief pitching we, we lost some of those guys, too, even though we have a nice foundation of Sir Anthony Alvarado, Brogdon back, and some other people back there. Um, and then we're going to just keep kind of open-minded towards middle infield. You know, we have with Gene's situation being a free agent. We have the versatility of playing start at short or second. And uh, we'll just kind of explore where that takes us. Okay. John Clark in the middle. One other question about Bryce. Uh, going into the examinations, was there hope and was there some expectations that maybe he wouldn't need surgery? So is there disappointment that this is the outcome with either the team or Bryce? Well, I can't say there was expectations of that. I mean, we know something was wrong there. Um, so we just didn't really know what to expect at that point. We always knew this was a possibility. We've known that for, for months, really. I mean, and I think everybody else knew that when he was shut down. Um, we wouldn't know until he got examined, and that was going to wait till after the season, which is what ended up happening. So there was no, I can't say, just, we just had to wait to see what took place. Okay, Mike on the right. Dave, uh, the wear and tear of the playoffs, do you see Nola, Wheeler, Ranger being healthy uh, at the start of the season and 100% ready to go? And also, what... The, the three rookies, do you see any of them possibly in the starting rotation at the start of next season? Well, um, the three rookies being which three are you referring to? Painter, McGarry, and Abel. Abel, okay. So um, those guys are, at this point, I mean, Wheeler, um, Nola, Suarez, they're healthy. You know, they pitched a lot of innings. I mean, you're always going to watch that going into the next year, but I'm not. I don't know why they wouldn't be ready to pitch the season. Something, you know, I mean, they're ready to go. They'll be ready to go. Um, I've had this throughout my career that pitchers were going, you know, some of the best four years in a row making the playoffs and pitching these numbers of innings or more, and we're already ready to go. So I, I don't really think that that's an issue. But, you know, if somebody is a little bit tired or a little bit sore, you have to be cognizant of that when you get into spring training. But that's like any other pitcher. I mean, you always are aware of those type of things. Um, as we said, those three guys will come to spring training with us. Um, I can't say there's the anticipation that they're going to make our rotation to start the season. Some are further along than others. Um, but they'll be in camp, and once you're in camp, anything can happen. We are keeping a spot open for a youngster 
And when I say youngster, not only includes those three, that's why I asked who else would Walter and Sanchez fit into that category and anybody else who may, may join it. Now, could two? Yeah, maybe, perhaps two could, but we're really only looking at one. That's why I think when we talk about adding somebody, I think makes sense because when you start, uh, not that two at some point won't be pitching in your rotation at some time. And Falter pitched, I guess, a half a season, uh, primarily from a starting perspective, and he, he won five, six games for us this year starting. So, um, but I, I do think that having another veteran arm, we lost Syndergaard, we've lost Gibson, we lost Eflin. When I say that they're free agents, doesn't mean that none of them can't come back. But we do need to, in our own mind, fill a slot like that. Okay. Howard in the front. Dave, uh, you, it sounds like you left the door open for Segura as a free agent to possibly come back. The first question with that is, if you sign a shortstop, is that kind of out of the picture? And the, the second part of my question is, is Zach Eflin a possibility also, or has that ship sailed? Well, first of all, I think we would sign one middle infielder if we do that. So I don't think um, whomever it would be, if it be a second baseman or a shortstop, we have Stott, we like Stott, we want Stott to play. We think he's only going to get better. We do like Sosa too, but I think at least knowing that we do want Stott to play, we could use Sosa as a utility guy, but we think Stott's an everyday player. So if we sign one, it precludes anything else at this point. Um, the second part was in regard, Zach, oh yeah, and Zach Eflin. So in Zach, we like Zach. Um, we like him a lot. Um, the door's not closed on him by any means due to our likeness. It would just be a matter of what somebody does contractually, what we would do contractually for whatever reason. Okay, Bill on the right. Um, kind of to follow up, you know, because you have so many young pitchers that could be ready sooner rather than later, if you get into the uh, starting pitcher market, would you prefer to do something like on a one-year deal, something shorter term, so that those guys aren't blocked? Um, I think we're open-minded to various alternatives. We'll just have to kind of weigh where it comes. We do like our, our young starting pitching, but I've also kind of learned that you never have too much depth um, with, at that position. And if you ever end up having too much, you always have trade possibilities too. Um, Nola, sorry, I have two more. Um, Nola, um, you picked up his option. Are you going to open the negotiations with him on a longer-term contract? Well, I just would say we'd love to have Aaron in the organization for a long time. And then, listen, I guess luxury tax, do you feel you'll be over it again? Would you like to stay under it? Does it are you kind of open-minded on that? Well, without any declaration, and you'd always like to stay under, because, uh, again, I've said before, you'd really rather not be penalized, because that's why they call it a penalty. But um, I think we're open-minded to having the best club we possibly can and see where it takes us. Okay, Alex on the left. Um, uh, last season when Bryce went down, it opened a spot for Derek Hall on the roster. Do you guys see that as a possibility, um, depending on how much time he misses because of surgery in 2023? It could be. Yeah, I mean, I mean we like Derek Hall. Um, I mean, he did a good job for us. He really did. So. Um, it provides us some flexibility in that regard. So he could be a guy that would uh, benefit because of that. And then a quick second question. Following up on um, the spot that you're envisioning for a younger pitcher, um, just what would you need to see from them, I guess, out of spring training? Like, what are you looking for in particular? Well, usually you're looking to have, um, I mean, first of all, you have stuff to get big league hitters out. That's a good place to start. Secondly, um, their secondary pitches that they can throw more than one pitch for strikes. Uh, how do they do things as fielder position, um, hold runners on, those parts of it. How do they fit in from a comfort standpoint? Do they seem like they're overwhelmed to come into the situations can also be important. Um, the consistency of throwing strikes. Those are all factors that would come into play. Okay, Dave, right in the middle. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Dave, to follow up on the tax, I understand you want to sp you prefer to stay under sure. it, but um, coming within two wins of a world championship after going over it for the first time ever this past season, how much does getting that close make you want to do something to push the needle a little bit? Well, we're going to push the needle to try to win. I mean, we're close, right? I mean, we're going to try to win. Uh, we won. Um, and I think we have a good ball club. We really played well uh, after the first third of the season, basically, and including the postseason. So we're going to try to win. 
again, you asked me what I prefer to be under. Yeah, I would prefer to be under it, but I didn't say we were going to be under it. So we're going to try to do what we can to make our club a championship caliber club. But we also want to be, you know, I, I, we want to be good for years to come too. So I, I don't want to look like, hey, we're just going to sacrifice everything. We, we, we did. One of the reasons we were able to win was also that the young players playing well for us. And I think good clubs have young players that contribute. So we want to be able to continue that type of trend for us. Okay, Marcus on the left. One for Sam. <clears throat> Sam, when you look at what Reese did this year, um, how do you regard his season and what you got kind of for the value and what his value is next season, considering what his arbitration number is probably going to be? Yeah, I think Reese was a really productive part of our lineup, part of our offense. Um, you know, like like in years past, he, he carried us at times. Obviously came up with a couple huge hits in the postseason and, and helped us advance to where we ended up getting. Um, he, he had a he had a, a good, solid year. I think, you know, Reese has forever been able to carry a team and he's shown that throughout the course of his Phillies career. And I think uh, he's also had times where, where there were, you know, two, three weeks where he, he struggled to get on base and struggled to kind of maintain that same at bat quality. I thought he did a good job of sort of smoothing out those waves this year. I thought he was this may have been his most consistent offensive year. Um, as Dave said, he continues to work hard at, on the defensive end. Um, and really, I think you can't state enough what he means in the clubhouse. He's, he's, a, he's a really valuable member of that, that group. He's really been the core of, of, of this group for a long time. So despite all the good things that he does you know, between the lines, I think what, what we really appreciate maybe most out of Reese is just um, what he brings to, to, to his teammates, you know, the, the kind of player he is, um, kind of kind of relationships he has with, with staff. It's, it's all really, really good stuff. And I, I don't think we can ever lose sight of that. Dave, um, it, it sounds as though if the market is outrageous, except for maybe a fill-in, back-end, middle rotation starter, that between the youth and between the growth that you hope to see from Nick and younger players like Bryson, you, you might be set. You might be okay going into 2023 largely undifferent, uh, kind of the same club. Well, I mean, could we go into it? It's like there. We could open up right now um, with the lineup. What will we have? You put Sosa at short and you put Stott at second base. Um, we have enough outfielders that we could fill in with where Bryce's situation would be no matter what would take place. But we're always looking to get better, you know. So I mean, it's not. I don't want to say that we're just sitting here and going to bring back the same club and we're content to do that. We're going to look to get better. Um, so uh, could we? I, I guess we could. I mean, anything ends up happening, but we're not looking to do that. Okay, Todd on the left. Dave, how, how right here? Uh, how do you look at the payroll in that you have Harper, Wheeler? Castellanos, Real Muto, Schwarber, all $85 million guys or, or more in terms of contract sizes. How much flexibility do you think you have to add another star type player if you find yourself within striking distance to get one of those types of players? I think we have flexibility. I mean, we did lose a couple of guys that made significant dollars, in fact, more than one this year. So we have some flexibility. Okay, with Scott and then Dave Murphy. Dave, you touched on you know having teams that made the playoffs year over year and um, <clears throat> dealing with the toll that that takes on player health and whatnot. Um, just to sort of follow on that a little bit, how much of your uh, discussions fa have to factor that in, given that in this case, the majority of them are, have, are doing this now for the first time? You know, they played a month longer than they're accustomed to, and how much of that has to get baked into to what you do decide to do in terms of how you build your roster? Well, it's a discussion point. Um, you, know, you also have to look at your early season schedule, how many days you have off, how often you're going to pitch them. I, I mean, one of the – you have to be a little careful, too, because if you take it too easy with guys, sometimes they're not ready to pitch, and it hurts them the next year more, too. I mean, so you have to factor all those things in. I don't think – I mean, no matter what happened in the postseason, which was 
good most of the way, and especially from the pitching perspective, the guys pitch well. We never brought guys back on short rest all year long, even in the postseason. We, we just never did that. They had a lot of rest in the postseason, actually, with their start. Very few of them were just on five days. So even then you're looking towards how you can watch guys because you don't want to hurt people. So I don't think that – I mean, they pitched more. They pitched more innings. But they weren't going out there where they were hurt at that particular time. You just have to be aware that, you know, guys throw a certain number of pitches. They throw a certain number of innings that you're always cognizant of that and you watch that in spring training. But it doesn't mean that you just – don't pitch them or shut them down. In fact, like I've seen that happen with some guys, and sometimes that's worse for them than continuing to pitch them forward because pitchers are made to pitch, um, depending on what ends up happening. And again, you have injuries, you have circumstances that could be different, but um, they need to get out there, need to get their arms ready. So we're cognizant of all those things. I do think it, we're, you know we do want to add somebody for our starting because. We do like those three guys at the top, and we like our young people. But, again, you're talking about depth. And, and even if you went long into the season or went short into the season and ended on whatever it was, October 5th, um, we'd still be cognizant of that. And also just, you know, 10 days removed from the last game, how much feedback have you received from JT on maybe how he's feeling given that, you know, I think he ended up catching 200 or so more innings than anybody else in the game this year? Have you gotten any feedback from him on how his body feels, and can he can he continue to maintain the workload? You know, 130 games or so that he's maintained all these these last five years. Well, he. Um, oh no! When I talked to him during the season, and during, he felt very good. He said, "I haven't felt this good per se in a few years." Now, last two years ago, so 2021, it was sort of a tough start from, from the very beginning. It hurt his hand. Um, and so I hurt his thumb at that point and then ended up battling through it. Um, I mean, you're always cognizant. I mean, he's uh, – and we did during the season, even though he did not um, – he caught so many innings. It wasn't like he'd catch three weeks in a row. He, he gave him rest with, uh, with Stubbs back there. So, you know, it, it's a situation where he's such an elite athlete – that I'm not sure why he would not be able to catch a significant number of innings and games, and he thrives on that, really. Um, I was talking to somebody, I won't tell you who, but that knows him quite well, said, uh, remember, uh, Randy Hunley used to catch 162 games a year. So he wasn't saying that he were looking to put, but it just that, hey, catchers have caught a lot of innings and they've been fine, and he's an elite player. And not only an elite player, He's an elite athlete that works extremely hard, that takes great pride. And I mean, there's, he's a really good, good player, and, and he had a great year. And I'm not, I don't know why he can't continue to do that for a while. Okay, Dave Murphy. Dave, I'm wondering, in, in your meetings, in these scouting meetings, how, um, how big of a focal point is getting the bullpen to a point where, um, I mean, you look at a team like the Astros, where they just, you know, run seven, eight guys out there that you know, throwing 95 and getting ground balls. And, I mean, your hitters talked a lot about it um, in the playoffs at how much of a factor that was. Um, you mentioned Alvarado, Dominguez, Blotty, Brogdon. But, I mean, how much are, are you really – how do you get your bullpen to a point where it has that depth, where you're not necessarily, um, you know, leaning on guys to throw 25 pitches and get you four or five outs in a high leverage situation? Well, I mean, you're always looking for it to be – as deep as possible. I think when you're talking about the Astros, you're talking about an exceptional bullpen that worked out. And even they had their top end guys that they went to in a short series. So you didn't get to the back 12, 13. You went to their top four guys that they went to on a regular basis. Um, and part of that also had to deal with their starting pitchers going deep into games. So it's kind of a combination of both. But with those guys that you have, you end up trying to add some minor league arms that we have that we feel good about um, that have the potential to pitch for us out of there and then we go out and try to add an, uh, another arm or two I mean unfortunately for us like Knable would have been another arm like that but he got hurt um, so he wasn't uh, so that's what your goal is to try to do that through that combination of factors people that you have people coming through your system and then 
um, make the right addition or two. I mean, you mentioned Kniebel. What, what, what do you make of the kind of, I mean, the reliever market is quite volatile year to year. Mm -hmm. It seems like very difficult to predict at times whether guys, you know, bounce back or regress or whatever. How, how do you approach, you know, the free agent market in that regard, um, kind of measuring what you've seen over X number of years versus what, you know, you might see moving forward? Well, you do a lot of work on it. I don't have any magical answers to that, and I don't know that anybody has magical answers. Um, I think what you do is you try to figure that out as much as you possibly can. I wouldn't really give you what we look at more than others look. Um, actually, our bullpen pitched pretty well for us this year as time went on, so we were really happy with it. But you're right, it's a volatile, volatile position. Um, but you see a couple clubs that, I mean, let, let's right now they've really gone big into Houston signed Montero for big dollars, and San Diego signed a couple of guys to big dollars, so they've sort of taken a different route. They've, they've gone that way. So I don't know that there's any specific one thing we look other than a combination of all the information that we have to try to make the most intelligent decision that we can. Last question. Um, Alec Bohm, did he change anything about the way you look at him over the course of this season? Um, Rob Thompson mentioned he's you know, maybe the most improved player that he's ever had as a manager over the course of a season. I mean, the defense is what it was in, in the postseason. Um, what do you make of that? And, and in your experience, have you seen the playoffs be kind of a springboard for young guys like Bohm, Marsh, Suarez, um, Bryson Stott? Well, I'll start with uh, well, the second question then with that. They can be um, because you're exposed to something that you've never been exposed to before. And I think with that, you also re get, can get confidence that even though you're told, even though you believe in yourself, all of a sudden you're there, you're doing it, and you're doing it against the best competition you possibly can in the game, at the, the, and everybody in the world's watching you, per se, in the baseball world, so it can help you. Um, I think that some of those youngsters that we're talking about, I mean, they just went through a long season. Um, they'll benefit by the experience they had. I wouldn't, they wouldn't probably tell you this, but they were probably tired at the end uh, I mean, I look at Bryson Stott, for example, what he went through the year, and he really started taking off with the bat and at the end went down a little bit. When you think about last year in 2021, he went to the Instructional League. I should say, he went to the Arizona Fall League, not the Arizona Fall League. Played every day there. Went to the mini camp we had in Clearwater. Got a lot of reps there. Went to spring training with the big league club. A lot of reps there because he's trying to make a team. Played a lot all year long, played late into the year. He almost went a whole year without ever getting time off. He has to be tired, you know, he's not a, so I think that he'll benefit by not only the exposure and experience, but now having a winter time to get some time down. Um, and Marsh was the same way and, and that. But um, I do think it can benefit them a great deal, the exposure that they have because they can regroup themselves and what they've been exposed to. So yes, in Bohm's case, I think there's a couple of factors. Um, one is he worked very, very hard on his defense with Bobby Dickerson. Bobby Dickerson helped him a lot from a defensive perspective. Um, and then I'd also say from the offensive perspective, Kevin Long worked with him very hard. He Tip of the cap to Al, because he worked hard with both of them on all facets of his game. He changed his swing from the year before. He, he drove the ball much better, caught up with the fastball much better. So yes, I do think that um, he made significant changes in that regard. And I think with that, he also started to grow from a confidence perspective. And so you could see the difference in him as the year went on, just even being around him. You could just sense that he was more open, talking more. Just To me, he just seemed like a different person as far as confidence was concerned. So I think all of a sudden you start to see maybe, and I'm, I can't tell you you had doubts because I, I never approached that type of talk, but if you're, if you're in a position where in your own mind you're wondering how you're doing, well, he worked, did everything he could to, to work himself through that on both sides of the ball um, from an offensive and defensive perspective, and you could see that he started to gain in confidence. Okay, we'll finish up with just a couple more beginning with Howard. Uh, both you guys had just – said really good things about Reese Hoskins. I have no problem with that. But I got to deal with the fans calling in and addressing what was 
a lot of the obvious questions. So my question, what are you laughing about? Uh, my, my question is, is the starting eight pretty much untouchable, I broadened it, uh, for trades? Well, I, I, I would never make a statement like that because it, you never know at this time of year what ends up happening. We're just starting the winter time. We're very comfortable with the club that we have, but um, I would never make a declaration on any team that anybody's untouchable. So, you know, we deal with the fans too. So um, you're not the only one. I will tell you, I mean, I was during the postseason, I was jogging through the town and people were stopping their car and saying, hey, great. Hey, great. Reese is fantastic. He just hit the home run right. You know, oh, fantastic. Then after the one game when we went through, I was jogging through town. Somebody stopped our, their car and said, what are you doing? You got to get rid of Reese Hoskins, right? And so it comes with the territory. So we deal with it too. But I, I think that that's why you, Sam talked about, you, you can't, it's a long season. It's a long season of ups and downs. And even in the postseason, it's a long season of ups and downs, even though it would only be a one month or seven games in a World Series, or in our case, six. So you have to deal with that. And, and I think you, you, the way I would look at it, and I'm, I'm only a little surprised because when I talk about the city of Philadelphia and in many ways a blue-collar type of nature and a work ethic, Reese Hoskins works his tail off. He works as hard as anybody possibly can. And he does the best to try to make himself the, the best player possible. But he's not a gold glove first baseman, for example. I mean, it's just he's made himself better. He also is a somewhat streaky hitter. So when it's going good, it's great. And when it's not going good, it's not so good. But the one thing about him is, like Sam said, consistency of showing up in the clubhouse, working hard. Um, you couldn't find a better person than, than this. So um, to me, it's one of those that, that you have to understand your players. And there's a lot of good things about him. But he, he's not the perfect player, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. Like he's going to be here. Yeah. Well, I... I'm not, again, anointing that, but we are tendering him a contract. Um, and so once you tender a contract, unless something comes up, you're, yeah. So you could tell him that, he, the, yeah, he's, he's the leading candidate to be our opening day first baseman. How's that? Okay, we got three, three finals starting with Destiny. This is for Sam. Outside of Painter, Abel, and McGarry, are there any minor league pitchers in the organization right now that you guys are looking at that could possibly contribute for you guys next year? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, there, there's a, a number, particularly on the on the relief side, we've got some some younger uh, relievers that I think are, are really talented. Maybe need to shore up certain parts of their game. Um, we've got guys like, you know, the guy that we acquired from from the White Sox this year, McKinley Moore, threw the ball really well, uh, particularly in the second half. Um, it's nice to see Andrew Schultz and his top end stuff just be, to be healthy and and um, get out there and compete and, and have some success. Um, Eric Miller is another one with, with some really high-end stuff we think can get big league hitters out, dealt with some injuries uh, this year as he has really uh, for most, most of his career. But when he's healthy, he's got, he's got big league stuff. Um, you know, th those are three that I think are probably um, closest to the conversation. And, and, and they're all similar in a lot of ways. They've, they've got, you know, they've got – their warts, like any most most minor league pitchers do, um, but we feel like any number of those three could could potentially help us in a in a really meaningful way. Yeah, let's finish up with Rob on the left. Dave, one more thing with Castellanos. See, there's a, a lot of talk, obviously, about him doing work during the off season to get back to where he was and so forth. How much of that is going to be off the field too? I mean, you had talked about player confidence. Does there need to be sort of an effort in that regard too with him? Well. You know, I think he deals with that. I mean, I, I won't get into specifics on what we have um, from that, but he, he's dealing with a lot of different things to try to get ready for next year. Okay, if there's no further questions, uh, thank you, Dave and Sam, and thanks, everyone, for showing up today. And Rob Thompson will be down momentarily. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Nice gym shoes, too. <laughs> See y'all later.